Two weeks away from the NBA season, and Patrick and I are ranking our Western Conference teams. Putting him into tears. Let's get into foul trouble. All right, here we are, the West. Wow. I feel like we've been talking about this specific episode because it's been such a dread to rank the West. Um, I've been not looking forward to this episode since pretty much last season ended. Yeah, so there's like a lot to get into. You know, our Eastern Conference preview is kind of like, okay, there's the Celtics and there's the Knicks and there's the Sixers and then who knows with Milwaukee and Cleveland's basically the same team. And no, the West is like, you need to actually (laughs) hunker down. You need to get all the lineup data. You need to track. Even the teams that are like film study. (laughs) Pretty close to what they were last year have like one massive like departure or one massive addition. Yeah, it's just like... There's so many teams that we could wake up and who knows, they're a top three seed in the West at the end of the day. Yep. So we're going to put them into tiers. We're going to start at our top tier, tier one. What did you title your tier one? So my tier one was just like bonafide contenders. Like they've been there. They've done that. They have the pedigree to be one of the, they have a player that has been in the playoffs, done it before. Um, at least to a certain extent. And then um, these are also very deep teams. What about you? I just, tier one for me is I can see them winning the conference. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's so essentially More than the Eastern pod, I feel like regular season factored in a lot more for me, only because I think seeding and actually making the playoffs, especially when we talk about, for me, the tier two, I think for you, your tier three, like actually making the playoffs is going to be a challenge for some of these teams that are definite playoff teams in the East. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and it's like, yeah, I mean, my my tier two could maybe be in my tier one, but they just have like massive question marks that I'm not like quite ready to elevate them to that status. Um, I assume, who did you have 1-1? One, one? So I had the Thunder. Okay, one, so one. did I. But so do you want to just say our tiers or do you want to get into the Thunder? Or how do you want to, how do you want to go about this? Mm. You have a massive tier one. I have a massive tier one because there's five teams that I I could close my eyes and picture them hosting the Magic Johnson Trophy in their best player's hands. Okay, l- let me now. go over <laughs> the Magic Johnson Trophy. Adam Silver, what are you doing? Um, uh, let me let me just say my three teams in my tier one and tell me if you don't have any so of these teams. What I'm curious about is the of of the Nuggets, the Wolves, the Thunder, and the Mavericks. I'm trying to guess which one didn't make your tier one. Do you I'm going to guess, guess it was the Mavericks? No, it was not. It was the Wolves. It was the Wolves. Whoa, it okay. Wolves. I think the Wolves, and I mean, we talked a little bit about the Wolves last week. Um, the Wolves just have a lot of like material difference to their roster, and I think they're going to succeed in a totally different way. But they are a super, super deep team, and I think they are primed for regular season success. But you don't see it as much in the postseason. Yeah, I just struggle to see how the pieces fit together super well. Like with a Anthony Edwards, just like supernova set aside. Like, what are like the middling yeah. ways that this season could end? All right, let's start with the Thunder, who we both had one one. Uh, so last season, the Thunder were 57-25. and 25. They were the number one overall seed. They were third in offense, fourth in defense. They had a plus eight-point differential. Their only real weakness was rebounding. Mm-hmm. They were kind of thin with Chad at center. They kind of solved that by bringing Hartenstein. Their lineup data is weird. They had a lineup of Shea, J-Dub, Lou Dort, Josh Giddy, and Chet. That five-man lineup played 1,700 possessions. They outscored the other team by nine points per 100 possessions. And then no other Thunder lineup had more than 220 possessions the whole season. That is so so crazy, especially for such a deep team, even last year in the Thunder. So here's where the Thunder get weird. Now, mind you, I'm about to do some negative Thunder talk. I still have them as my 1-1 before everyone freaks out. Thunder fans out there. Yeah. So last season, the Thunder didn't play a lot of Chet at power forward. And when they did, it was with the other Jalen Williams. And Patrick, they were not good when they did that. They actually were negative 0.7 when Chet played power forward. It's worth noting that they were good, you know, with Chet on, with Chet off. Chet, it was kind of one of the things we talked about in the Rookie of the Year race last year was Chet really didn't seem to affect their point differential that much during the regular season. Um, So I'm curious how much Chet power forward Isaiah Hartenstein center we're going to see. I feel like they're going to be staggered almost entirely during the regular season. That's what I would hope for. You know, I'm always a proponent of, like, 
play your seven footer at center unless they absolutely cannot play there. Um, I think I'm just most impressed by this Thunder offseason because I feel like we talked about rebounding. That was a huge like gap in why they probably went out in the playoffs a little bit earlier than they wanted to last season. And then just like adding to advanced stat defensive darlings like Alex Caruso and Isaiah Hartenstein to the fourth best defensive rating last year is just like filthy work by Sam Presti. Yeah, I think the um, the other thing for regular season. So last year, Chet, 82 games, Dort, 79 games, Shea, 75 games, J-Dub, 71. I think injury regression is very possible and kind of over do for this team given how healthy they were last season which is we why we even talked about that last season yeah like i think there is a little bit more regular season downside than i think people might be ready for with this team especially if they're going to be doing lineup experimentation with their two bigs hartenstein is still going to you know, not offer the shooting that chat really gave the driving lanes for Dub and shea last year and i think what i'm worried about is like because it doesn't seem like chet and hartenstein might be able to play together given the past lineup I'm a little curious, like, if it's going to help them at the very end of the playoffs. Um, for my range of outcomes, I can see them as high as the one seed and as low as the four seed. Yeah, I think they have a really, really high floor. Um, and I, I think we've had this whole conversation without bringing up Shea at all. Like, this is a multi-time runner-up for MVP at this point. This guy is... It, it doesn't get more real. I, I don't think Shea is, like... I mean, he is included in that best player in the world conversation, but I don't think maybe quite as much as he should be. Mm -hmm. And really, when we look at the playoffs from last season, Shea was the one guy that actually like came to play, especially yeah. later on in, in that um, Maverick series. Um, Jalen Williams did a little bit of a disappearing act. Chet was not that like same Chet that we saw at points during the regular season. But um, I mean, the great thing about being a super young team is you're you get better. Yeah, you're going to get better. So I think uh, I, I look for Jalen Williams to have a huge year. I look for Chet to really establish himself um, even more this year. And then even a guy like Kaysen Wallace, like there's a lot of room to grow there. And they have even more like high pedigree um, like rookies, first year, second year, guys that aren't even going to see the floor, really. Yeah, this team's really good. That's why we both have them 1-1. One, one. So the team that you're going to laugh, I had number two was the Lakers. But I also wanted, when I started this exercise, I wanted to give them their own tier because they're the only tier one team that has, I have. I think they have the lowest floor. Um. Yeah. I mean, I mean that's why I, you don't have them in I your tier one. Have them in so I debated one. giving them their own tier one and a half as the as the Lakers tier, but let's skip them for now. Okay. The Timberwolves, you also don't have in tier one. I had them third. So we're going to go to the Nuggets now? Um, I have the Mavericks, number two. Whoa! Uh, I know, I, I know. know. So I was Mr. Mav last season. I was all over the Mavs. Last season, the Mavs were 50 and 32, but they were 21 and 7 after their trades. The problem is this is just not the same team at all, the, the finals team. I mean, it is at its bones. It has its two main offensive engines coming back. I really think this is going to be the season of Luka Doncic. Like, spoilers, he's going to be my MVP pick. And I think Kyrie really proved to me that he still has that ability to feel out how much his 1A superstar needs and fill exactly that and then i just really expect Derek lively to take another step forward he was so incredible in the playoffs last year and then i think the surrounding parts are just gonna kind of be a wash so what i'm a little i'm there's a few things i'm concerned about this team so they lose Derek jones jr they lose josh green and basically the guy who's playing in for them at that three spot is clay thompson i compared all their shot charts and Really surprising, and I don't think this will be the case with the Mavs, but just worth bringing up, Clay just like apparently doesn't shoot corner threes. It's just not I, on a <laughs> shot chart, which shocked me. Um, but is... you're replacing two guys who are taking about three three-pointers a game at okay efficiency and replacing them with a much more efficient three-point shooter, but a guy's taking three, nine three-point attempts a game. And Clay's not taking a lot of rim shots. So I'm a little worried because one of Luca's strengths is not just creating open threes, but creating great rim looks for his role players. And I'm a little worried about like replacing these athletic rim attackers with 
just a kind of more of a shooting focus player. I mean, in my mind, Clay is more of a replacement for like the Tim Hardaway Jr. like random minutes. Some Josh Green, but Najee Marshall is really who they brought in to be their new Derek Jones Jr. And I think he's just as good as him, to I be honest. I don't know, though, because Derek Jones Jr. is starting three. Clay's going to start at the three for this team. Um, But I mean... He doesn't have to close at three. Uh, I'm not a, the biggest Clay Thompson believer, but I, I yeah, do neither am I. I do believe in is. Najee Marshall. Um, and I think if like if Clay works, then it's like dynamite. You you're gonna really be able to bury teams if Clay's got his shot going, especially in the first half. But um, if it's not working, pull him out, put in Najee Marshall, PJ Washington, and you've got the same. You know, functionally the same thing that you found so much success with in the second half of last season, where, I mean, they had the seventh best defensive rating uh, post-trade deadline last year. They really they really proved something to me, Yeah, especially I, on the defensive I was end. all over the Mavs last year. You know what's funny? Do you remember before the pod, I said they could win 66 games? <laughs> I guess winning the conference is better, but I don't know. I'm a little concerned about... I, just I, I don't think it. they could win 66 I don't think they games. can this year either. I For range of outcomes, I have them as high as the two seed and as low as the eight seed. I think they're going to be in that top four, top five seeding. I guess I'm, I think they're going to be around 50 wins again. I just don't know if they're going to be able to keep up a 75% win percentage that they did after the trade deadline. I think that's what really worries me. In the playoffs, I mean, I love them. I love the rim protection. I love Luka, obviously, just being able to be the best player. Yeah, I mean, he could he could win pretty any much series. any series for yeah. you. Which is why I had them 2-2. Too, too. It's like, other than the Nuggets, nobody has a guy like that where it's just like, yeah, it's, they, it's kind of LeBron rules um, from the like teens. It's just like, it doesn't matter who we have. We have him. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm all in. I mean, I, lo- I love the Mavs last year. I just, I don't know. I'm a little worried about, I think there's going to be games where they're just raining threes with Clay and Kyrie and Lucas just running it up. And I think there's going to be games where last year's ugly Clay Thompson shows up and it's like, wow, he went <laughs> two of 12 from three and it killed their offense. I think that's what I'm just worried about in the regular season happening a little too much. The other part of that is early in uh, last season, Kyrie missed, I don't have exactly how many, but he was like in and out of there lineup so i think like there's some like easy wins to gain there just from having Kyrie, but he'll probably find a way to miss games yeah he always does but i had them in tier one as well i'm also very high on them so that means your last tier one team was the denver nuggets yes it was okay so last year the nuggets were 57 and 25 uh they were the two seed or they were the three seed they were what they seed? were the, the they were a top three seed right here. <laughs> they were the two seed they were the two seed so last year is weird their new starting lineup is obviously going to be jamal murray christian brown michael porter jr aaron gordon and nikola Jokic. last year that lineup only played 52 possessions um granted it was amazing in those 52 possessions but too small of a sample size i have no doubts the starting lineup is going to be awesome yeah i have no doubts this team is going to be great i'm really worried about the depth and i'm also worried about jamal murray just in general. Yeah. He yeah. looked horrible at FIBA. Um, he looked really bad against the Timberwolves. And if we remember last season, the NBA like let ratchet up the physicality. And it seems like in FIBA and in the more physical NBA, Jamal Murray just like, I don't know. Not quite he, as effective. He did look really good against the Lakers. He did. He looked um, awesome. Mr. Lakers one yep. seed, selectively forgetting that. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm teasing you. Um, yeah, I mean, KCP is gonna be a huge departure. But the more I think about it, I think Christian Braun can supply 80 to 90 percent of what KCP, especially last season, was providing. And what I really like about the Nuggets this year is, I mean, their bench definitely is not perfect, but they are huge positionally yeah, just everywhere. Just like last year. Even their backups, though, I, I think even more now, like Russell Westbrook is a really well-sized backup, I guess. You can quibble with Dario Saric, but I think he offers some versatility that um, will be really cool to see next to Jokic. Yeah, I'm. I was super high on Peyton Watson last year, and then he just didn't really play in the playoffs. Um, but I guess that's my big worry for losing KCP isn't the starting lineup because it's like, yeah, you can throw Christian Brown in there, and I think they're going to be awesome. I just now it's Christian Brown's not on your bench. Yeah, and I think that's my worry is like Julian Strother. Like I think because of he's athletic, and I think when you envision him, it's like, oh, he's almost like the. Who's that guy in Portland? 
Oh, like uh, he's like not as athletic, yeah. shade and sharp. Yeah, he, yeah, you're like kind of envisioning like strawberry shade and sharp, but in reality, like he was not good last year. Yeah, um, rookie, rookie, rookie but it wasn't. There wasn't anything that promised. Like when you pull up his cleaning the glass page, it's all blue boxes. There's nothing that was no. There's literally not one thing that I was like, oh, that's what. No, there was really nothing. Um, so I'm really worried about the bench, and I, what other thing I'm worried about as it relates to Jamal Murray is I think the Timberwolves exposed this big issue with this team that teams didn't really seem to figure out with the year they won the championship was they only had one perimeter ball handler. Mm-hmm. And I know Westbrook, I suppose, alleviates that, but <laughs> Westbrook sucks. Why do NBA teams keep forgetting this? This guy is literally like bottom 20th percentile in points per shot attempt three of the last five years, despite taking 95th percentile shots at the rim. This guy takes some of the best quality looks in the NBA and can't make them. The one facet of Westbrook's game that hasn't literally deteriorated to bottom of the league status is rebounding. And his usage is probably going to go soaring on this team because ball handling is an issue. This, yeah, this I is mean, bad. This is really bad. Like, what are they doing? I, that This is where it, I, I think Michael Malone is like sneaky on the hot seat this year because the, there's a clear answer to fixing this problem that you're talking about, and it's putting the ball in Nikola Jokic's hand and more and in like a more heliocentric way because they just don't have the personnel that they have had in the past. But, you know, I even look at like, I, I looked at 2021-22, uh, the year that they lost in the first round to the Warriors when the Warriors ended up winning the championship. And this was a MVP season for Nikola Jokic. They ended the season with uh, the 15th be- or the sixth best offensive rating and the 15th best defensive rating. I think this was a season without Jamal Murray entirely. And they had got like their two guard depth was Will Barton, Austin Rivers, Rookie Bones Highland. Um, their point guard depth was Monte Morris and Facundo Campazzo. Yeah, <laughs> like these guys are not not NBA players even, and um, they were still able to have a top ten offensive rating and a defensive rating in the, at least midway through the like league. So I think if they're able to replicate that, I really have no problem believing that they can be a, a top three seed in the playoffs. And with Jokic, I just, I believe. Yeah, I, Jokic, I still have his number one player in the world. I still think there's kind of a gap between him and whoever's second, in my opinion. I still love Jokic. I just, Who I do don't you like, have second? I don't know. I think I'd have Luka right now. But me too. I just feel like I don't like the vibes of this team. It's very erratic. They, it, it has more variance than we've seen yeah. in the Jokic era. So I kind of similar to the Mavs, I could see them as high as the two seed and as low as the six seed in the regular season. I have a feeling this team's not going to get the one seed. Yeah, no. I, I don't think they'll even push for the one seed, though. Like, yeah. it's That's going to be a heavy lift in this conference. Because I think even if Jamal Murray's like, okay, Jamal Murray's just never going to be the same guy if the NBA lets them play more physical, he's still going to be a good player. But I'm just really worried about this whole, just what the Timberwolves did, where they're like, what if we just you know, full court pressure Murray and then they can't get into their offense because there's no one else who can bring the ball up to court. Yeah, I mean, I think it bears a reminding that like Murray was not 100%. No, not of at all. course, like you're never going to be 100%, but I think he was not even like 75% in that um, second round series. So, um, and they have enough ball handlers where they can like schematically get around that, but I, I think they just weren't doing it well. And they were going up against the Timberwolves. They are yeah, able to up. like have ball pressure that, I mean, maybe the Thunder can replicate. But other than that, I don't really think any teams um, in the West can. Yep. Maybe the Pelicans. Okay, so that's the end of your Tier 1. You yes. had the Thunder. You had the Mavericks. You had the Nuggets. I had all those teams in Tier 1 as well. I'm a little lower on the Nuggets and Mavericks. I had, the, had them at the bottom of my Tier 1. Um just because I don't, I'm just a little worried about them. And I kind of rank them more as, uh, I rank these teams in mind more as like their regular season outcome ranges instead of their playoff outcome ranges. Mm-hmm. But I do love both the Nuggets and the Mavericks because they have, in my opinion, the two best players in the world. Yeah, it helps. Um, okay, so the rest of my tier one was the Lakers and the Timberwolves. Which team do you want to talk first? Um, 
let's talk about the Lakers. I, I had the Lakers in my tier three, which is kind of my like super high variance tier. Yeah, um, I mean, that's where I wanted to put them in a high variance tier because I was like, I could see them as high as the one seed if everything uh, works. Dude, and I could see them as low. You could see them as high as the one. What's, what's the argument? Okay, them? so here's the argument. Last year, 17 and eight after they benched Torrey and Prince. The year before, 18 and eight. That's a 56 win pace. That's the two seed last year. Okay, what are they replacing these Tory and Prince minutes with? Rui, but that's what I'm saying. They didn't they didn't even need to replace them with a player. They just needed to run the lineups that was good 2 years ago and those lineups won at the exact same pace. 17 and 8, 18 and 8. 56 win pace. I mean, this team basically if they just stuck with that lineup the whole year would have been the 2 seed. And okay. you're looking at them very differently if that's the case. Um they also went to the Western Conference Finals with this lineup 2 years ago. They did. I, my thing is, like, I just don't believe in their depth. And this is a conference with, like, teams with insane amounts of depth. When you look at the Timberwolves, when you look at the Grizzlies, when you look at the Thunder. And, like, I, they have no... Who are their big men other than Anthony Davis? Oh, I mean, the big... I don't love the big men rotation. Like, it's just not there. And we're coming off a season where everyone is, like, heralding the return of the big man and physicality in basketball. And then they're, like, point of attack perimeter guard defenders are just not up to snuff. This was a team that was playing Spencer Dinwiddie huge minutes in the playoffs. Yeah, so if you remember last season, I had two scapegoats. I had Prince and Ham, and they're gone. So if I really believe that, I got to double down on that. Okay. I just think this team is really big, kind of like the Nuggets, size-wise in their front their their front court with LeBron, Rui, and Davis. Also, I, the return of the big man, Davis is the second best big in the whole conference. I love Davis, but... <laughs> and he's going to be playing big minutes. This is, this is the thing that we need to talk about with these guys. Anthony Davis played 76 games last season. That is the most games he has ever played in a season in his entire career. And LeBron James just turned 40, and he also played 71 games, which is the most since 2017-2018. Like, this is not going to repeat. I I think I'm a little... I just... LeBron was awesome all Olympics. He was awesome last season. He and he great just played in the, in the Olympics! But he's looking... He looks amazing. And I think also, too, this team is sneakily a way better shooting team than people are giving them credit for. Rui was a 40% shooter. D'Lo was an amazing shooter on high volume. LeBron retooled his shot form last year, was a great shooter the whole season. Reeves a great shooter. And I think, like, this new offense where they have a lot of guards going downhill, they've got Davis playing more in, like, a hub. I think the starting lineup, which has been plus 6.6, um... And also the whole team, any non Torian Prince lineup was plus 6.6 .6 for the whole season. Like the Lakers were really dominant when that one guy didn't play. Yeah, I just, I just feel like you're their bench about is how trash. bad that guy was. Their bench is but awful. But they can always play with Davis and LeBron. And I think one thing that's going to be different about this year's Lakers is the Davis on LeBron off lineups are going to be a lot better than they have been in the past because the offense is being restructured around using Davis as a hub player, which is going to make the offense have more structure and flow. And also, like, they have, they probably have the best top two of any team in the whole conference. The, yeah, they might. But if we've learned anything, like, that depth doesn't... Important. Like, depth is the most important thing. I just, I don't know. I guess what I don't understand, though, is if they have all these flaws, why were they winning at a higher pace than literally every other team in the West when they just played the lineups they were supposed to? I mean, if you look at the 82-game sample size, they weren't. But they weren't playing the right lineups. But over a sample size of, they were 35 and 16 with this lineup. That's over half a season. Yeah, I, that's a 50 game sample size where they were a 56 win pace like this is a good team. I, I think this is a good team. <laughs> I don't think this should be anywhere near a tier one team. But I think you, there's just too much talent. Th that's I, I'm not saying this is a trash team. Like, yes, that lineup is awesome and very, very effective. But there are like super real reasons why this team one is like not a the most viable uh, playoff team because of their perimeter defense. I think that's like a huge problem for them. There were multiple times last season where different teams just like traded off picking on Austin Reeves and, and um, D'Angelo Russell. Um, like, yeah, I think it'll be great to have Jared Vanderbilt back, but like, what does that even look like? We never, like, he cannot consistently stay healthy. I like, I don't really believe that this team is going to be able to replicate that kind of health. 
And they just, I, I think big depth is a huge issue here. And I, I'm not a believer in Jackson Hayes. I, and like, they have six guys who I feel good about. And I don't think that's really enough to be a top tier contender in this Western Conference. I guess I'm just much higher on the potential of how dominant this team could be. And I love the staggering because LeBron can turn any athletic big into a dive pick and roll big. And I think Reeves and Davis has shown quite a bit over the last two years that it's a pretty good two combo of playmaking and finishing. I don't know. Like That's why I have them as this crazy range of outcomes, to your point, with the health and defensively on the perimeter. Like I could see them as low as like 7-8, but I could also see like a great season where they just – play the right lineups, they just do the smart things, and they win 56 games. Yeah, I mean, it could it could all go really well, but I just I don't really see any scenario where they're finishing above a, a Thunder or, like, even really the Mavs. Like, I think the talent gap is just, is just big. I don't know, though. Like, is the third best player on the Mavericks that much better than Austin Reeves? Yeah, I Anthony guess, Davis I guess is a lot right. better than Kyrie Irving. Like, I don't know. I think you're sleeping on just like this team has like two of the best six players in the conference. That alone is pretty helpful. Two of the best seven. I don't know. All right. Well, yeah, we weren't going to agree on the Lakers. So, what is yeah. your range of outcomes, though? Um. Yeah. I mean, I think they could probably be like the three four seed if everything clicks, and then I think they could be. I mean, play-in. out of the play in if it goes really, really bad. But I, I'm a believer in JJ Redick. I think like he is going to get them right. I, I think they really needed to embrace uh, analytics in a more real yeah. way last year. That's obvious. Um, I'm an Austin Reeves fan. I think um, like with another year in the league, maybe he can completely make me eat all my words about like his defensive um, acumen. Um, I just haven't seen it yet. And then, like, I mean, if you are able to get 70-plus games out of LeBron and AD, like, yeah, that's a great place to start. They give you a chance to win any game. Any game. Yeah. Uh, And the other team I had in Tier 1, because, again, my Tier 1 is just I could see them winning the conference. I had the Timberwolves. Um, So last year, the Timberwolves were obviously just historically great on defense. They were 56-26. and One lineup had 400 possessions. Conley, Ant, Jaden McDaniels, Nas Reed, and Gobert. Do you want to guess what that net rating was? I don't know. Tell me. Zero. Wow. <laughs> they played teams to a draw. Uh, they had a 104 offense, which is worse in the league, and a 104 defense, which is just like best in the league. Um, so here's where this team is really confusing to me. Like, I think DiVincenzo is a way bigger addition than people are going to give it credit for. Because one problem with the Wolves is like when Conley wasn't out there, it felt like they're like, they didn't have that one guy who could come off a screen and take an off the dribble jump shot. Like Conley was like a low key, such a big part of their offense because of his off the dribble shooting, his away, ability to attack, like drop coverage, his playmaking. Obviously, DiVincenzo is not the playmaker Conley is and the connective passer, but like 40% shooting on 8.7 attempts. Like I think he's going to help this perimeter shooting and help the non Conley lineup so much. Here's where this team is confusing to me. And I think this is why they didn't make your tier one. You're replacing Towns as a spacer with Julius Randle, who. Doesn't take corner threes. He shoots 35% on his catch-and-shoot threes the last two seasons. So the shooting's not really there, right? Um, but here's the weird thing. The Knicks lineups where it was like Randall, non-spacing big and questionable shooting, were amazing. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. Randall just seems to make it work. He's a great regular season player. Yeah. So what do you mean by, like, I, you could see them winning the West? Like, Advancing to the finals or yes. getting the one advancing seat? to the finals. Everyone in my tier one is a team I can envision making it to the finals. Um, I could see the Timberwolves like winning, like getting the first seed. But when we get to those like shooting spacing issues, I, I agree with you, Dante Divincenzo. Like, is going to be a huge help for them. I just wonder, like, when the going gets tough, like, are you gonna bench? Jaden McDaniels for Dante DiVincenzo? The answer is maybe. Um, He's just a guy that they have invested in a lot in a way that like a lot of the time teams will not bail off you in like a high leverage playoff situation. And you just look at like, like what you were saying, like Julius Randle, 
not a guy you want shooting at high volume. Literally the least efficient high volume playoff scorer of all time. Rudy Gobert, a non-shooter. Uh, Jaden McDaniels, 33% from three last year. Even Anthony Edwards, 35% from three. It's like we are depending a lot on Mike Conley from yeah. a spacing perspective. And spacing is so important for this team, I would say, even more than some teams. Because like that's really Anthony Edwards' bread and butter. And you got rid of one of your like very... like high upside scores in Carl Anthony Towns. Um, and I just, I'm very interested interested to see how the Julius, like the areas on the court that Julius Randle really likes to live in are also the- That left block, yeah, that left wing. The areas yeah. on the court that Anthony Edwards likes to scorch through. And those two things are a bit at odds. Yeah, I think though, the reason I'm really high is I just be, if they're not top two in defense, I'd be shocked. I think this team's just going to be so good on defense. I think DiVincenzo also has a lot of good defensive upside, so I don't totally, think... Totally, totally. I think putting him in for Jaden isn't really a, like a give-and-take situation. I think it's more of a just-a-give situation. And I think the other facet that Randall's going to give them that Carl couldn't is you can kind of play through Julius more in terms of like we can play through Julius and... Sp- and let you know Ant play off the ball more because Ant was 100%, 100% tile usage percentage, which means he was probably one of the three players who handled the ball the most per possession on his team. And I, so I checked it out. Ant, 35% on the season, but 41% on catch and shoot threes, which is not elite. But it, it does give me hope that, like, okay, if Ant can actually get to play off the ball a little bit more because Julius is playmaking, you can kind of have different identities where you can play through Julius or play through Ant, depending on the matchup. My worry, and I think it's similar to yours, is, like, I kind of like this team a lot better if Nas Reed started and Julius was, like, a high minutes six man who was just like, all right, Julius, just... You just kill yeah, these cook, backup bro. bigs. Yeah. yeah, you go. You go destroy Jackson Hayes and make my Lakers prediction look stupid. Yeah, I mean, I would like the Timberwolves more if that was the team. But I just, I don't. I have a hard time believing that that's how they happen. would function. I think the only thing though is I think they're gonna be good even if they don't do that. I just think because I'm just the Knicks, right? The Knicks were like weirdly dominant and weirdly similar. When they had like Julius Randle, Mitchell Robinson, the high usage guard, and then two like mm-hmm. perimeter defender guys who can kind of shoot. Like no, those lineups were like plus 16 on like high possessions. Like yeah. I don't see why the Timberwolves can't do the same thing. I guess the one difference with like the high usage guard is like Jalen Brunson is much more of like a table setter at his absurd usage than Anthony Edwards tends to be. Um see, I actually think Edwards is a slightly better passer than I think I think. Edwards is better at like the read and react passing than Brunson is. Yeah, but he's like I, I think like second pass. Yeah, um, Jalen Brunson just like I don't know. He, he very much runs that system in New York. And I guess the difference too, to your credit, is Brunson's shot diet is much more like mid ranges, mm-hmm. whereas Edwards is like. I'm, but Edwards takes a ton of mids though. He I don't does. know. Yeah, but I know what you mean. His his primary is like I want to get to the cup and I'll and not settle, but I can hit that midi if it's like the mid the rim, mid rim attempt's not the most ideal, but. But I I want to like stress again. I like I think this team is going to be really good this season. Yeah. Um. I just think that there was a certain championship ceiling that I think existed last year. I mean, after the second round when they beat the Nuggets, we were both we both picked them to win the Western Conference Finals, and they had just kind of hit a like youth Snag, ceiling yeah. in in what that's what I observe. And Luka Doncic just <laughs> and Luka Doncic was very very good. Yeah, I mean that's the other problem too with this team is like Edwards. I just Edwards is really good. I think he could cement himself as a top five player, which is crazy because of how good he is. I think in a, a random NBA season, you'd be like, "Why is this guy not the best player?" But it's like if they play the Thunder, he's got to he's got to play Shea. If he plays the Mavericks, he's got to play Luka. If he plays the Nuggets, it's Jokic again and again. That went to seven. Like Jokic, they could have lost that Nuggets series. Like the Nuggets Easily. generated a ton of open looks off of Jokic. It's just they couldn't convert them. And that was like. I think there's a lot of talk about that Ant playoff run. He was next level, looked like the best player in the league against the Suns. And then against the Nuggets, that kind of faded away. Um, And like a lot of their wins was because of like a crazy Nas Reed game or because of a crazy cat game. And then by the time they got to the Western Conference Finals, it was like they were just trying to like duct tape everything together. 
And uh, he had a couple of good games, or he had like one, one, two good games in that series. But um, it's just that consistency that comes with age. Yeah. And which I, is why I would have liked to see them run it back with that core just one more time um, to see what it could be. Because I, I, I really believe that that core is talented enough and unique enough to win a championship. But it was just a little too early in the life cycle. Yeah. I, you know what's weird? I actually think their floor is a little higher with Julius. I think regular season I think even with playoffs, Julius though, and Dante. I just think there's too many games with Cat where it's like four fouls in the second quarter. But he wasn't Cat's like, like that as much but he last postseason. But he had like a couple games like that in the postseason. But he also had like, you know, 40-minute games where he's guarding Jokic like yeah, half the, the time. but he also like couldn't shoot for like four games in the West. Like he kind of was one of the reasons they went down like 3-0 in the Western Conference Finals. I don't know. I just, I'm not a big cat guy, but that's one of our, I guess, another one of those players that me and you are never going to. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you had them, I'm guessing, at the top of your tier two? Uh, yeah, I had them. So my tier two is titled like deep like a contender, but I'm still not sold. And then my one other team in this tier is the... Uh, uh, Memphis Grizzlies. Yeah, so I I titled my tier two the battle for the six seed. There we <laughs> go. Because I had five teams in tier one. Uh, should I just rattle off my teams? Yeah, 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 sure. I had your Phoenix Suns. There we go. I had the New Orleans Pelicans. There we go. I had the Sacramento Kings. There we go. I had the Golden State Warriors. Ooh. I have them in tier four. Yeah, I kind of, I, I initially had them in tier four and I had to bump them up the more I researched. Uh, I had the Rockets and I had Memphis. There we go. Yeah, I think all six, to me, all six of those teams can get the six seed. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. with you. <laughs> I, I, I'm That's with why you. I have this, the battle for six. But I think of any of those teams, at least for me, I see like a very realistic path of getting the one seed. Um, and then, I don't know, it. Ooh, if which, there's development. I don't think any of these teams get the one seed. Who do you think it is? The Grizzlies. Oh, that's why I have them in my tier two. Okay. Okay. So let's start with Memphis. Yeah. Um, so basically Memphis had the year from hell last year. Yep. They finished 13th in the West uh, with a 27 and 55 record. But amid all of that, amid like literally every player on their roster being injured, they were still able to eke out the 12th best defensive rating in the league, and they had the dead last 30th best offensive rating in the league. But I think it it is a useful exercise to like remind ourselves what this team was the last couple of years before. Um, they had the second seed in the West in 22-23 with the uh, 15th best offensive rating and the second best defensive rating. And then in 21-22, they actually were able to get all the way up to the fifth best offensive rating in the league. And then they still had that fourth defensive rating, just like these Taylor Jenkins Grizzly teams are elite, elite, elite. And so really my one question, or I have two real questions with the Grizzlies, is what does the Zach Eady experience look like? Like I, I talked a lot last season about like historically rookie centers really struggle in their first year. And this is a rookie center with four years of college experience is Massive. not <laughs> not giving any size to anybody. Um, and he's actually really mobile. Um, can he like buck that trend? And then John Morant, like, can you be the consistent offensive engine to an elite team? We saw it one year in your career that... Um, what year? The 21-22 uh, season. You were able to like generate that much offense. But now we have a guy in Desmond Bain who is a lot further into his development. We have a guy like Gigi Jackson who's starting off the year injured. Um, but he brings a lot of juice. A guy like Vince Williams Jr. that they were able to under uh, uncover. Um, I think that's a real defensive stopper wing that you'll be able to use. And then Zach Eady has... All a lot of the Steven Adams things that we loved, the screen setting. I think he has the upside to be a great rebounder. I mean, nobody's gonna be as good, quite Steve as good as Adams, Steven Adams. Yeah. But does all of that equate to a top 10 offense? Because I, if it does, I think they could easily be the one seed in the West. Wow. Okay. So the reason I have them in tier two is I was kind of looking back like you did, and this team was great, but this weird thing about them being the two seed. 
is if they were that same record last year, they would have been tied for fourth. Um, I just, I they peaked at that two seed, but their peak wasn't as good as like the Mavs last season, the Nuggets last season, the Thunder last season, so or the, or the Wolves. So I think that's my worry is I think the West was uncharacteristically weak the one year they were the two seed. Not to take away from them because I thought they were a good team. I thought they had injuries at the worst time in their first round series against the Lakers and it just kind of, it wasn't really like the fair shake to them. I guess I'm just, I just, the reason I have them in tier two is I do believe in the Jaw, Bane, like Jaron core, and I actually am pretty high on Edie. I think Jaw's going to make him a good pick and roll threat. I'm just a little worried about the half court offense still. I think the defensive rating might push back a little bit, you know, now that, you know, Jaw and all these guys are back, although Jaw is an amazing, you know, transition defender at times. Like, I don't know. I guess I, I think I, th- I think I have this team as high as five because I just have a hard time seeing them push past 48 wins. That's my real hesitancy. I think one other thing to remember with this team is like in in those years where they were really successful finishing with the second best record in the West, they were also ahead of schedule. Yeah, you know, that's true. like Jaw is so young. Um, Desmond Bain is still so young and they're replacing. I mean, I feel like we're in last season they're replacing dylan brooks with marcus smart who like say what you will about marcus smart boston well, so celtics part of my, fans part of a- <laughs> but he's a lot better of a decision maker than dylan brooks was and i think i think maybe dylan brooks might be a better defender today but you've got the other guys you've got vince williams jr marcus smart is a pretty good like it replacement level for that yeah you know it's funny you say marcus smart because part of the reasons i was a little low in the grizzlies too was i i looked back to our are they washed pod and i remember you mm. talking about a certain marcus smart and I- <laughs> marcus smart had a very tough season last year yeah. um i think he'll bounce back a little given the role his role change. is yeah. gonna be a lot um, more simple no and i think they lost to anthony melton who was a big part of like the, the thing about those grizzlies teams that was really unique was their bench was really good like brandon clark was just amazing it, he was like the pre Jokic floater king or it was like does this yeah. guy ever miss floaters he's coming off the Achilles um I I guess I'm just I'm just worried that the bench point differential is going to be a lot worse than it was the years they were kind of really dominant and I just think the West is so much better so that even if they were ahead of schedule and they might even be a better team I just don't I still don't think they're going to blow past that 51 win mark and I think you're going to need 55 to win the West this year yeah I mean there's a reason why I have them um in in the fifth spot um but I I think like also, like they have more players that I'm pretty sure are good than before when like there was a lot of like Question marks. Jake Laravia minutes yeah. and like uh who's the guy that went to Brooklyn, um, their wing that they drafted super high. You guys can comment, you know it doesn't name. matter. Um He's but, in the East like, now, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm very excited about GG Jackson too. Like I just that dude is huge. Yeah, he's a lot of potential. Athletic, like he could, even if he just like develops a little bit, I think could be a, a huge swing for them. And I don't think there's a path for him to even be a starter. I think he's going to start at the three, no? Um, no I, from at, what I've seen. On their depth chart right now on ESPN.com, which I don't think is reliable. <laughs> from <laughs> what I've starter. seen, their plan is to start Marcus Smart. Um, oh, three guard. And I think that's like a a reputational thing. Yeah. Um, but, um, hey, I'm all for it. Throw Gigi Jackson in there. Throw Vince Williams in there. Yeah. All right, so who... I don't have this tier really in order at all. Okay. Um, I'm guessing you have your son somewhere around here? Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you want me to read you my high variance tier? Yeah. So I have, like, kind of 1A, 1B in this tier, our sons and Lakers. Um, then I have the Pelicans. Then I have the Kings. It's just those four teams. Okay. Um, do we want to get into the Suns? Yeah. Um, I'm going to set okay. a timer for four minutes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, 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 wait. I feel like we're going to need more than four for this team. <laughs> so, I mean, the Suns were obviously a huge disappointment last year, but um, they ended up 49 and 33, which is a really good record. Which is a, in a really good West. In a really, really good West. Um, it was Bad vibes from the get-go um, that um, they had a coach that just did not fit the personnel that they had. And that's kind of where it all starts. I think Budenholzer is such a good fit for this roster. They were able... Let me just read off the role players that the Suns had on their bench 
last year. So Bol Bol and Grayson Allen, they're back. But then they had Yudoka Azabuke, Kieda Bates Diop, Drew Eubanks, Jordan Goodwin, Eric Gordon, Nasir Little, Shemezi Metu, and Josh McCogie. Or Josh McCogie. Okogie. McCogie. Um, all of those guys playing huge minutes. And like all of those guys, it's kind of like there's an idea they could be good, but um, they were not. And they're replacing that with Monte Morris, Tyus Jones, um, Josh Goge again, Royce O'Neal, and then their rookies, Oso Iguodaro and Ryan Dunn, and Mason Plumley. Just a, in my opinion, like a next level like jump on the the bench depth in a team that like you're a three star team essentially, so you don't have to like be have this huge jump. But the, where the Suns really struggled last year, the Suns were 25th in the NBA in turnovers. They were a hugely turnover prone team because they just were not getting into sets. It was a slog to get into any offense. They addressed that with Tyus Jones and Monte Morris, two of the assisted turnover gods. The ball is going to be in their hands most of the time. Um, and then the other thing was they were 25th in the league in three-point shots attempted. When you look at Mike Budenholzer teams, every single team he has ever coached has been top 10 in three-point attempts per game, except for one, and that was the 2016-2017 Hawks. So I think they really addressed their weak points from last season. Um, with that being said, I am very concerned about the defense for this team, the the Path to success is outscoring every team. Um, it was kind of incredible that they were um, 13th in defensive rating last season. I don't f foresee that repeating, um, even though they have much more quality big depth behind uh, Nurk. But Nurk also had a really healthy year that I don't necessarily see that happening again. But um, that's kind of the Suns in in my in my view. They have very high like upside. I think Bradley Beal is going to be a lot better this year than he was last year. It was just a from the bad back to start the season to the broken nose to the broken finger. Like it was just one thing after another, culminating in the worst game of Bradley Beal's career in Game Four of the first round, and. Uh, there's there's only up from here. Yeah, I think in a more physical NBA, which is what we're going to see this season compared to most of last season, like having guys like Booker and Durant who can take really tough like isolation looks is going to be really helpful. I think last year the big funny thing was like take more three guys, and then it was like Booker and Durant were like, how about a contested twelve footer? But I, it is true with Budenholzer, like making them take way more threes as a team. And I'm kind of curious, like if Booker and Durant are going to be able to kind of modify, like in their preseason game against the Lakers, Booker seemed a lot more like adept at like getting to the three point line instead of getting to like the 15 foot mark, mm -hmm. um, which I feel like is low key kind of a carryover from like Olympic book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for sure. And that's a thing, you know, yeah, like, and, and again, learning Durant, a different Durant, role. Booker, just like LeBron looked really good on the Olympics. They look so two of the the Lakers and the Suns had two of the five guys closing every single look line. at our high variance Kings. Let's go. Both of them going to take way more threes this season. It's going to be hilarious. Um, Yeah, I'm I'm Phoenix again. Like I was kind of low on them after like a couple weeks of play last year. I started the season very high on the Suns. I think me and you might have had them like both top three in our preseason yeah, break, we, like I going to last season. No, but I love adding like actual point guards to this team. Um, I like that they're not going to have to play through Beal as much. I like that we've seen now Booker for sure can kind of play in a more high usage or low usage depending on what the game demands. And I got to say, I thought Durant at times looked a lot better last season than he did like two two seasons before. I thought in the playoffs, Durant was really falling off. It was something that really scared me about the Suns last year. And I think like in the first round, obviously you guys got swept, but it wasn't like Durant... It wasn't. It wasn't like Durant. the year Durant played for the Nets and they got set wet by the Celtics. And it was like, wait, is Durant able to score on Jason Tatum like at all? Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't like that. It didn't look as ugly for him personally. So, yeah, I think the Suns. I didn't even have a range of outcomes. I literally, they're the only team I didn't do real notes on because I knew you were going to come prepared and ready. But yeah, I could see the Suns probably as high as four in the regular season and maybe as low as nine, ten if injuries really 
pile up if Nurk isn't able to play enough games and then all of a sudden the backup center is a big issue because he's out yeah that's the weird thing about the the Suns is like I feel like they could probably sustain a Devin Booker injury better than they could sustain a Yusuf Nurkic injury yeah I think so um and like that's partially because Nurk was really good for them last year and I think his role is going to be a lot easier for him to succeed in this year because it's going to be kind of like they were having him initiate so much of the offense last year and this year it's just going to be like go down there and do what you do best big guy like go get those rebounds um and I mean we'll see the word on the street is he's going to try shooting threes which I mean, we'll yeah, see. I've heard that. I don't know. We will see. It's Slim Nurk. He's good. <laughs> no, um, Slim Reaper and Slim Nurk. I'm not a super, um, super confident about that. But I, I just like that. Like, they had two glaring weaknesses, and I think they addressed those pretty much as hardcore as you could with no money to work with. Yeah. So I think as a Suns fan, you got to be feeling good. Next team, I'm assuming in your tier because they're in my tier. It's the Pelicans. Yep. Okay, so the Pelicans were a surprising 49 and 33 last season. You know, the Suns and the Lakers were also like, well, they won 49 and 47 games. Yeah. It's um, like some franchises would like, be like elated. The, the Lakers, Bucks, and Suns were the entire season being like, what the fuck is wrong? And then, oh, they won almost 50 games. But okay, so Pelicans are kind of weird right now. They lost Jonas Valanciunas. They added DeJounte Murray, but. Patrick, who is going to play center for this team? Daniel Tice? Daniel Trey Tice. Trey Jemison? Yeah, Daniel Tice started in their preseason game against the Magic. Trey Jemison? Yves Missy? Carlo Matt Kukic? Um, Yeah, I mean, I think the only two guys that really could are, um, I mean, Daniel Tice, because he's just a vet, and then Yves Missy, maybe, if he just ends up being the rare, really good mid-round rookie center. So I have a take. Daniel Tice is horrible. Yeah, I'm like I've watched the guy. He is he cannot defend other bigs to save his life. I feel like every Daniel Tice, I feel like is the guy who gets like elbowed in the face and never gets the call from the refs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so here's the weird thing about the Pelicans. I was like, wow, this team is probably set up to be horrible defensively, right? I know they've got all these great perimeter defenders like Herb Jones and Trey Murphy can play great defense. Obviously, CJ's not the greatest point of attack guy, but like they were good defensively when Zion played center last year, which I don't understand. I don't understand. It doesn't make sense. They How were many eighth in minutes defense. was that? It was like a good amount of possessions. A lot of the times, though, they'd have him play with Larry Nance, so it wasn't okay. as many as the Larry Nance and Zion. So he's more center on offense. Center on offense. Yeah. But but there were a lot of lineups with him at center, and they were good on defense. They were eighth in defensive rating as a team last year. Um. So this is a weird team where – I look at the numbers. The numbers tell me I'm wrong, but I don't believe them. I think this team is going to be bad on defense. I Maybe totally not, agree. But, I but totally no agree. Statistical evidence that they will be, which is where I'm a little confused. And it might just be that their point of attack defense on the wings is just so strong. Um, what scares me about this team is like, I could picture Zion being really good in the preseason game against the Magic. He looks a little thinner. It doesn't look like 35 pounds thinner. Uh, he doesn't look. He still doesn't look like Duke Zion in terms of leaping. His speed seems pretty back. His finishing's pretty good. But like, it's a lot of point Zion, which I love. But I don't love like, oh, Dejounte Murray. You want to play off the ball again? Yeah, Br- uh, Brandon Ingram. Like You're- Brandon Ingram has to be a big part of this team. But no they matter don't want how him you to be. It. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, that's the thing. I don't like the Brandon Ingram situation. I don't like the vibes on this. team. I hate the vibes on this team, and I just like. Like, they were 13th in the league in rebounding last year, which isn't even that great. And they're just going into this season with no, no center. centers. <laughs> like yeah, It's hard. Like, they don't have centers on their roster. Yeah. That, that, that we've, and, like, and it seen. makes me think to, like, you know, like, this team does have a lot of elite perimeter defenders. But you know who else had a lot of elite el- perimeter defenders? The Brooklyn Nets last year. And the Brooklyn Nets were not good, a good defensive team last year. I could see, and they had a lot better of a center than anything <laughs> that the Pelicans have. Yeah. I like that they have more creation. I mean, I'm a huge Zion fan. Same. Um, I want to see just like long runs of game where it's the DeJounte Murray, Herb Jones, Trey Murphy, Zion Williamson, and someone else. Um, I don't care who. Um, just because I think, like, I 
do you just think back to that play-in game against the Lakers? It really felt like one of those games that defines a player's career in how Zion was just completely taking over a game where you had healthy Anthony Davis, you had LeBron James playing well, but Zion was just the best player on the court and then he gets injured. And like, I hate being this guy, but like, I have no reason not to believe like there's going to be a long Zion injury. And when that happens, like, how does that affect their rebounding? So, like, how does that affect their creation? Well, as you know, Zion, who we love, is a bad rebounder. Which he <laughs> is. I'm a little worried about this team. But at least he's a big body that's hard to get around for other people to rebound. Yeah, I, yeah, I just this is this team is weird to me. They won 49 games. I don't see it. I don't understand how they were so good on defense last year at times. But at the same time, everything I'm looking at tells me. There's a world where this team finishes like 10th on offense and 11th on defense or 10th on offense, 10th in defense, and they're as high as the five seed. Yeah, I think they just have like a very low floor. Yeah, and I have a lot of realistic at, pathways to get to that yeah, floor. One of my tier two teams is going to be the 11 seed. Mm-hmm. And like I could see them being that 11 seed if this team is just a rebounding and defensive disaster. But I could see them as high as five if all of a sudden it's like we're going to play – you know, Kings basketball from two years ago where, yeah, he's not Sabonis in terms of like size and rebounding, but we can run up and down the court. We can splash a ton of threes and Zion is just a stupidly efficient rim finisher. Way better perimeter defense than they than yeah. those Kings teams. Yeah, had. so I think the Pelicans almost belong in that your tier of Lakers and Suns in terms of like they could finish with a crazy high regular season variance. Don't love them for the playoffs for all the reasons we've said. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, yeah, and they are they are in that tier for me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, okay, the next Sacramento team, Kings. I've got three more teams in my tier two, the battle for six. I've got the Kings, the Warriors, and the Rockets. So the Kings are the team I want to spend the least time on. Okay. <laughs> they're like, like the a Cavs. true Lakers fan. No, they're like the Cavaliers to me. Like it's what? Well, they added DeRozan. That's huge. I, do you think that's gonna make a difference in the postseason? Yes, in oh, a negative way. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So exactly. So yeah, like I don't know. Like so, they're forty six and thirty six last season. Uh, last two years, they've been one of the healthiest teams. So I don't want to be the negative wish. I'm not wishing injury, but law of averages says they're gonna have some sort of injury luck decline this year because they haven't had it in two years. I mean, last year they were fourteenth in offense, eighteenth in defense. They're like a middle of the road team. The problem is, I just don't believe in this team as a contender. Like of all of the tier two teams I have I think they have the lowest playoff ceiling the other weird thing with this team is they're not old like Fox is in his like no, kind of like young. mid late 20s like Sabonis is under 30 like this team Keegan Murray is like 24 but I don't really see what the like what is like a deer and Fox step up season even look like you know what I mean I don't really even see like what that I mean, season he's been looks so like. good he's these last so couple good. years yeah. I don't think that's what's coming I just you know the like creation obviously takes a jump when you bring in a guy like DeMar DeRozan. Um, But I think the defense is going to take a step back. And that's not even to say Harrison Barnes was like that great last year, but he just has better size and it has for both of their careers. Harrison Barnes has always been the better defender and I'd still take Harrison Barnes today. Um, But the, the, the bench is just kind of gross. You know, like, I don't love Alex Len minutes. I don't love um, Trey Lyles minutes. Kevin also, Herter has been a huge disappointment. I, I kind of like the Jordan McLaughlin pickup. Um, and then Keon Ellis, like, is he able to replicate what he gave yeah, also, last year? Yeah, like, I like Devin Carter in the draft, but, like, you know, there's not a guarantee he matches Davion Mitchell, who they traded away. Well, also, he's what did he do? He like broke his leg or something. He's not even going to start off the season. Yeah, playing. I, I, sorry, Kings. I just the problem with this King, the reason I, I don't have fun talking about this team compared to the Suns or the Grizzlies or the Pelicans is like I could see one of those teams winning in the first round. I just cannot see a world where the Kings win a first round series. The other thing that, like, I think sneaky makes the fit weird is. I looked at the Bulls were 28th in pace last year. Yeah, yeah. And that was, was one of my concerns when they got DeRozan. That was with DeRozan, like, handling the ball a lot, like, really high usage. Like, what does that look like when DeMar's, like, finding his spots with these other, like, guys that 
honestly should have the ball way more than he should have it. That's my weird thing with the Kings is I love De'Aaron Fox. I think De'Aaron Fox is super underrated, super underappreciated. I think he's one of the top point guards. Like I think what we saw him do in the playoffs, not this past season, but the year before that, was like bona fide. Like okay, if this is if the really good team is around this guy, I could see it. But like. That's the weird thing. And honestly, I'm a pretty big Sabonis guy. Like, I think the proof proof is in the pudding pudding. that this guy is, like, a generational rebounding talent and, like, one of the very few true centers that we've seen be able to, like, actually run a very functional and above-average offense. Above offense, yeah. Um, But he, where Sabonis cooks is where DeRozan cooks. Yeah, I just don't like the whole... DeRozan taking touches away in the half court from Fox. Um, the other thing, too, like the whole Malik Monk thing last year, I know Nas Reed ended up winning six men, but like that was ridiculous. They weren't that good when Malik Monk was on the court last year. I, I'm kind of like, I feel like you should just start Malik Monk at this point. Like, he's obviously the fourth best player on your team. Like, why not just like, yeah, I don't know, pump up the minutes. I don't. Um, lo- I don't love the Kings. Go all in on offense, but it's not that I think the Kings will be bad. There's a reason I have them in my tier two in the West. I could see them as high as the six seed. Yeah, they could just <laughs> rattle off wins, like <laughs> just like how we saw the Bulls last year win way more games than they probably should have. That was because DeRozan just kind of figures out a way to win games. Yeah. Okay, my last two teams in this tier, who I you don't have either of these teams in your tier, the Rockets and the Warriors. No, they're in my next tier. Okay, Title, so probably too young, probably too old. <laughs> <laughs> so the Warriors were the team that I was like, dude, I don't believe. In. Last year, I was all the way on. I don't believe in the Warriors. So I still don't believe in the Warriors. But like the Pelicans, there was a lot of numbers that got thrown in my face, and I was like, ah, I, I'm an objective man. So I was kind of expecting this team to be bad, but the Warriors were. Plus 10.7 with all Steph on CP3 and Clay off lineups, including a big possession lineup, 12.5. This team was one of the best lineups in the entire NBA last year. Steph Curry, Pajemski, Wiggins, Kaminga, and Draymond Green. Uh, Patrick, Wiggins actually played 71 games last year. He was way healthier than I think we all remember. He was around. <laughs> um, so the reason I have this team in my tier two is because if there's a Curry injury, it's over. It's it's so, so over. <laughs> so uh, I I the like they added Melton. Honestly, if there's a Draymond injury, like it I could think be it's kind of done. Yeah, but like so the thing with the Warriors is like they have DeAnthony Melton, who I think will help their bench, kind of like the way CP3 did last year. They've got Trace Jackson Davis coming off the bench still. Like I kind of like this team way more than I thought I did as a regular season team. If they stay healthy, I could see them as high as the four seed. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. And if weirdness, weird Draymond, Curry injury. That never happens. Weird Kaminga's not getting enough touches. I think they could be as low as 11. Here's the the equation that they cannot avoid. Draymond plus Trace Jackson Davis or Kevon Looney plus Kaminga. Those lineups, which like Draymond doesn't want to play center. And honestly, I get it. Like, he's not sized to be a center at this point, um, and he's not that young. They can't really avoid having a lot of those lineups um, with Steph, and there's just not enough shooting there. Yeah, I think they did find some magic with the, like, Pods Curry amazing shooting plus Wiggins Kaminga, like, crazy diving to the rim athleticism, which is, like, a really fun, like, rim attack. It's like a... (laughs) Uh, advanced stats analytics dream like rim attacks from athletic wings and like threes from efficient <laughs> shooters. Steph Curry, Steph Currying. But I think the the concern you had for the Lakers is a similar concern I have for the Warriors, where it's like you have this one lineup, which is awesome. But what else do you have? Yeah. Yeah. And well, and to your point, like that Lakers lineup is way more like doable than this Warriors lineup. Like this Warriors lineup is like it's like the death lineup. In a, like, stunty way that, like, you can't play that crazy huge minutes in the regular season because it's just, like, it doesn't sustain like that. Yeah, yeah, I just think this team... And Curry was healthy last year. Weird thing with Curry, he was not good for most of the Olympics. Yeah, I don't know if that matters. I'm just throwing it out there. He was very up and down last year as well. On the aggregate, he was really good, though. He was way better on the aggregate than I remembered, which is... Kind of one of the reasons I'm a little higher on this team now than I was before I started doing my research. But, yeah, I think this is also a high-variance team. Yeah, yeah. I mean, hey, you got Steph Curry, so that's a good place to start.
Mm -hmm. And Um, so where are the Rockets in your tiers? So they're in my tier four, uh, probably too young slash too old. It's three teams. It's Rockets, Warriors, and Clippers. Oh, okay. So I would have the Clippers a tier below those two. Okay. So the Rockets were 41 and 41, 20th on offense, 7th on defense. Weird team, filled with depth. Most of their most played lineups were bad. But yet, (laughs) yet they underperformed their expected win total by five games by point differential. Okay, so I was like, what's going on with this Rockets team? All right, Patrick, I have a fun uh, fun Rockets question. They have a they have a wing like this guy's I would consider him a guard, but he plays wing for this team and another guard who when they're paired together, this team is weirdly dominant. Who do you think those two players are? Amen Thompson, you got one. And Jalen Green? No. Um what's the other archetype? Sorry. A guard. Uh, a guard. So it's Amon Thompson and Dylan Brooks. I don't and know. Fred Van Vliet. Fred Van Vliet. So these Makes guys sense. had thirteen hundred possessions. That included the two of them. The Rockets were plus ten point five. <laughs> that, that's a big sample size of being really, really good. So for perspective, like on the NBA season, the only team that had a better than ten point differential last NBA season was the Boston Celtics. Like, yeah, that's crazy. Like, I know we throw out usually we're only really talking about the lineups that are this dominant. So it makes it seem more common than it is. But that's not common to have a rookie and an aging guard like this produce historically dominant, you know, things. And I think like what's fun about this team, it's Sengun off or Sengun on green off plus four point six green on Sengun off plus one point two. Both on plus 0.5. This team is weird. They have so many good players, so much depth. I don't think they all fit together, but also uh, the rookie Reed oh, looks I really good. I mean, you good. know, he's, he was my favorite player in this draft. Yeah, he's, Amen Shepherd, Thompson yep. was my favorite player last, last draft. draft. And I think they, like to your point with the Fred Van Vliet lineup, Reed Shepard and Amen Thompson just fit together fit perfectly yeah so um, Amon Thompson is like the small forward in like every great lineup did you last season. did you look into his uh all-star splits uh advanced all-star splits I last haven't. year so he had pre all-star his net he had a net rating of minus 3.3 post all-star he had a net rating of plus 7.3 so that's a 10 point Swing. flip yeah uh, um Pre and post All Star, which is like that's the kind of thing you see with that superstars have in their rookie season. So I mean, I think, and oh, oh my God, I watched a little bit of their first preseason game, and he is just like he's like a poor man's LeBron. Like J- J- Jalen Green had a finish where it was an up and under, where his head almost hit the rim. Yeah, they're so <laughs> freaky athletic. I love this team. They're so versatile, but they just don't. I don't know. I I don't believe that they're going to be able to find the combo of all these players quick enough to factor into like a real contender in the West. I I don't see them as why I have them down here. I don't see them as a real contender. But what I love is the whole being seventh on defense last year because Mm -hmm. young team committed to defense. Udoku seems to be a pretty good coach at just like. We're not we're not messing around. We're gonna yeah. play hard nosed defense. They can definitely improve on the twentieth on offense. I just feel like this team they don't have the one A guy, but I kind of like that last season. We walked away from it being like, okay, maybe Sengun. You know, at the beginning of the year we were like, holy Sengun. I think I kind of liked that at the end of it. We were like, well, Jalen Green might actually be something. Granted, that sixteen game win streak was against mostly horrible teams, and when they played the Warriors, the team they really needed to beat, they got destroyed. Yeah, but I I love this team last year. I love this team this year. I, I have a hard time seeing them getting above 45, but I could totally see them being like the Kings from two years ago. Yeah. I, I The interesting thing with Shen Goon is I think there's a general sentiment that he is like this 100% offensive tilted player. He was mainly healthy for them at the at pre-All-Star yeah. last year. Pre-All-Star, they had the sixth best, best defensive rating in the league. And then post-All-Star, they had the 16th best. Like... This guy could really be like the cornerstone of an amazing defense. Yeah, well, with him and Jabari yeah. as a combo. Yeah, I, I, I adore this Rockets team. I think this might be one of my favorite teams to watch. Like maybe the team I'm the most excited to watch. Just I love the piece. I love how athletic it is. I like the Stephen Adams edition too. Yep. 
Like that, I, I love, yeah, that that's going to help them against the Sun Goon. I, I'm a big fan of the Rockets, but unfortunately, the West is stacked, and I don't see them going above 45 wins. But I am really rooting for the Rockets to make the plan or better. Yeah, yeah, that would be an awesome story. I, I like this Rockets team as well. Um, okay, so we've got my four teams left. <laughs> my my last team in my probably too young, probably too old tier is the Los Angeles Clippers. Um, of course, I know there's going to be a lot of very visceral feelings towards the Clippers. Um, it's, I feel like it doesn't even make sense to throw out like what their ratings were last year, but fourth on offensive, um, and 17th defensive rating. Um, they still have Ty Lue, who for my money is the best coach in the NBA. Um, and, but they are a very different team than they were last year. Um, last year they were built around Paul George and Kawhi and they like just sh shoved in this James Harden shakeup that like made them one of the stories of the regular season last year. There was stretches in the season where they looked like the best team in the league and there was stretches where they looked like the Los Angeles Clippers. Um, I think it's going to be a lot more like that this year, but, um, this is a team that has to win. There is, they have no reason not to win that. I mean, other than not winning, but like they should really want to win. They don't want to give the thunder a top 10 pick in the draft this next year. And so I think the way they went about trying to win makes sense to me. They were like, we've got James Harden. Who knows what we got in Kawhi? So we are just going to make a Harden ball team. They went out and got a bunch of real 3 and D guys in Nicholas Batum, Derek Jones Jr. They still have Norman Powell. I mean, they still have Kawhi Leonard. Who knows what they get from him? He's about as good of a 3 and D guy as you can ask for. And while I don't think they Harden ball has a ceiling like it did maybe seven years ago where the ceiling was number one seed in the West. I think if everything goes right and they have a relatively healthy season and they get a good season out of a guy like Kevin Porter Jr. and a guy like Norman Powell, along with obviously they need a really great season out of James Harden, I think they could be a top six team. I just think that's not exactly, a, there's not exactly a straightforward path to get there. Yeah, I I am not. I am just not my issue. And we talked about this on our risers and fallers Harden shot below 30% in almost half of his games last season. Like it, this guy is, there's a chance it's like a disaster. It definitely, there's the, like the a see the floor is, is deep. I don't see sure. how he's going to be better than last year with how old he is. He's 35 Leonard. I think will play a career high because I don't think this team knows they know they're not going to make it, but I, I don't know, man. I just think the West is too good. I think Harden is way too big of a question mark. And, but that's again, that's why we both have them this slow. Yeah. Yeah. I, like you see what I'm saying. Yeah. Though. Like I, they, that's the thing. They have a good roster. They like, have a lot of, they have NBA a lot of players, good yeah. NBA players. Yeah. Um, and that goes a long way. That like, does. Let me tell you, it goes, that's why the Rockets were not good last year is because they didn't have enough, NBA players who had done it in the NBA. Too yeah. many ideas of NBA players. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I've got the Clippers as my sole Tier 3 team. My Tier 3 is called the Los Angeles Clippers. There you go. And uh, yeah, I could see them as high as 9. I think they can make the plan. Maybe maybe as high as 8. Maybe as high as 7. I think they could be as low as 13. Yeah. 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 I, I could see them getting up to like 6 who knows that it's, i cannot see. it's gonna be so close is the thing no matter how you chop it up all of after you get past the first four seeds in the west it's gonna be really really close yep okay my tier four is just called the san antonio spurs oh mine's called wemby <laughs> yeah so okay uh yeah so quick notes i mean these are the bottom three teams in our estimation uh spurs i have no doubt the cp3 wemby lineups are gonna just be like absurd the problem is when he played 29 minutes a game last year, let's say he plays 33 minutes a game this year. How bad are the Spurs going to be in those 15 minutes when he's not playing? They are going to suck. Their roster is terrible. Yeah, I think the starting lineup is actually going to be pretty good. Just like defensively, I think CP3 is going to give Vassell and Wemby a big offensive boost. I, I'm, I'm actually 
excited about the lineup. I'm not excited about the team. Yeah. And uh, also, to your point, with every CP3 conversation, like, when he gets hurt, we're going to have the same issue as last season, where when Jones is in with Wemby, it's great. And then when Jones is out, they're not that good. Can I also just point out something about Chris Paul? Last year, he played 26 minutes a game, averaged nine points and six assists, mainly all against backups. Yeah. Chris Paul is back in the starting lineup. He's playing against starting caliber lineups in this West, and he is going to be hounded. The even oh, you're the last po- you're poo pooing the CP3 Wemby. I am poo pooing the <laughs> CP3 Wemby. Like I obviously, like, it's not a high bar to cross to get better than what the Spurs had last year. But I'm sorry, I have to poo-poo the <laughs> CP3, CP3 Wemby connection. <laughs> CP3 is old. He's really old. And he is just not the same player that he was even three seasons ago. Can I offer you Castle threw down a nice dunk the other day? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 29% from three. Stefan Castle. That's... <laughs> That's the other thing is just like, can I read to you all of their roster members who shot under 35% from three last year? Yeah. City Sissoko, Blake Wesley, Mahmoud Kalashvili, Sohan, Zach Collins, Wemby, Dominic Barlow, Trey Jones, Keldon Johnson, Malachi Branham, Charles Bassey. Almost all those guys are going to play real minutes again. And then the guys that shot over 35%, Chris Paul, who is n- not a guy I want to rely on to shoot three-pointers. Um, Devin Vassell, who's coming into the season injured already, he's injured, Julian Champagny, and Harrison Barnes, who, did you look at the on-off Oh, Harrison for Barnes. Harrison Barnes last year? It was awful. Don't forget who was on my wash watch. I it's had Harrison true. Barnes on my wash watch. Kings had negative 6.4 points per 100 percent differential with Harrison Barnes on the court. Oh, well, who is backing him up? Trey Lyles. Like, Trey Lyles was his backup. Yeah, I mean, that was a big thing, and it's a worry for this team, too, as I highlighted in our wash watch, was like Harrison Barnes used to be the 3 and D who could attack a closeout with a rim attack or a mid-range pull-up, and now he's the 3 and D who cannot attack a closeout. Yeah. Um, Okay, and my Tier 5 is the Jazz and Trailblazers tier, and I just wrote they're trying to tank. Yeah, I mean, I I was looking into the Jazz, and, of course, they made the big trades at – Trade deadline, getting off of Kelly Olynyk, Ochai Agbaji. Um, Post All Star break, they had the 21st best offensive rating and the 30th best defensive <laughs> rating. And uh, I didn't realize this. Um, they had the worst defensive rating of all time last year. And those are our West Power rankings. <laughs> Thank wow. you for listening. Yeah, that was way longer than our East. Um, all right, Patrick, like last time, who are you predicting to win the conference? I am predicting I'll go with the Thunder. I feel like it's it's time. It's it's time for a Shea Shea run. And I think that they could challenge the the Celtics. I think they match up pretty well against them. I don't know who I'm gonna pick. I genuinely think you obviously are gonna pick the Lakers. I want to, but I just feel like the thing is, I feel like last year when we started, I was so like Nuggets are going to win. Yeah, I really felt like that. This is the way I feel about the Celtics right now in the East. I there's no team in the West that I truly feel like that I'm like, this is the team. My thing about the Thunder more than anything is just like they have an answer for everything. I don't know if they're going to be able to score enough. I think they have the tools for that, but it, there's a lot of development that goes in there. But they do have like a defensive answer for everything. That's why I chose the Thunder. I'm going to choose the Thunder as well. But I feel very good about the other four teams I have in Tier 1. <laughs> yeah. I, I, mean, I, that's think, all, I think all one. five of those teams could do it. That's why this was a really hard exercise for me. But yeah, I, I, I think the Thunder, definitely the rebounding thing. I guess my one worry for the Thunder is just... I need to see proof that Hartenstein can be additive and not just a different tool because I just don't like that if to solve a rebounding issue, you have to take off one of your best players. I think that's what scares me a little bit. Yeah, but either way, but either way you're every, replacing Jalen Williams' yeah, minutes Lakers, with Lakers, bench depth is flawed. Timberwolves, spacing issues. Nuggets, vibes, bench depth is very bad. Yeah. Mavericks, like we have to see how it all looks. They also have depth issues. So all of these teams are flawed in their own way. So I think I'm being a little unfair to the Thunder. Um, so I guess we both have the Thunder and we both have the Celtics. So 
I think that means one of those teams isn't going to get there. Yeah, no, probably both. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, should we do a hot streak shooting slump? This was a long Hot streak shooting? Um, do we, are we not starting the best take or stake yet? Next week, next week. Okay, okay. Um, you know what? I feel like we should just call it. We should call it. Okay, we'll catch you guys next Wednesday, our last pod before the season. That'll be what, what awards predictions and yeah, all that. Awards posi- p- predictions. Oh, my. Luca I'm MVP. You already let the cat out of the bag. I know, I did. I did. No, right. Maybe I'll change my mind. <laughs> we'll catch you guys later. Peace.